All right. So I know that we'll probably have people uh, popping in and we'll hear the dings in the background as they arrive over the next few minutes. But you're all were on time. And so I want to get started for you. So first thing I'm going to do, let me go ahead and get my notes ready. And let's go ahead and go through a couple of housekeeping things about how this class will work tonight. And again, I know we'll have a lot of people chiming in the first few minutes. So I apologize for the ding in the background. But I, like I said, I want to get started for all you folks. My name is Eric Gross. And uh, let's go ahead and move on to the, um, the first slides in this whole shebang. Let me talk about this silly picture that we have. Uh, my name is Eric Gross, and I'm the co-founder of the Tech Academy. I'm really happy you're all here today. A um, little bit of background on me. Not much. It's not really about me, but I, I've been a software developer um, for, for decades. Uh, technical background that began a long time ago in the Navy uh, when I was a nuclear reactor operator and electronics technician, a bunch of other nerdy stuff. And um, I'm just really glad to be here. Uh, and if in, I can be helpful in any way with tonight's presentation, that'll make me very happy. So as you can tell, I have an assistant in the background, Regina, who is um, busily letting people into the class and um, is here to help uh, monitor the chat, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, answer questions. There will be an opportunity for a Q&A uh, towards the end of this. Um, if in the off chance we have any problematic students She'll take care of giving them the boot so the rest of you can enjoy the class as you have, have every right to. Uh, I, my golden rule is really Will, Re Will Wheaton's rule, which I won't say out loud, but just be nice to each other. Be courteous. I know at this point with the age of COVID, everybody's used to using online you know, uh, software for meetings. But just in case you're not that familiar with the Zoom way of doing things, just look to the selection for who you're going to chat because you can choose to send direct messages to individual people in the class although probably wouldn't make sense to or you can broadcast it directly to, you know, to the assistant um, which is in there with the, the marketing name um, or you can you know put it into the full group chat so if you have any questions about that just put them into chat and my assistant Regina will, will help out in a moment here I'm going to show you a very very brief video about the Tech Academy, so you at least have some orientation on who is this outfit anyway that's putting on this free training and you know what do we do for people. And then we're going to dive right into the workshop. And I, I'm going to go over a lot of stuff in the workshop, hopefully clear up some fundamental concepts for you about you know computer programming, how software is made, how computers work together, and hopefully give you a taste of, of what our teaching methodology is like and help you. We'll have a Q&A uh, &A at the end, so if you've got questions, note them down. Uh, I'll be glad to take as many as we have time for at the end of this. And uh, throw in some additional data about the Tech Academy right at the end there. And here we go with the video. Hello, I'm Eric Gross, the co-founder of the Tech Academy. Our school delivers cost-effective and self-paced online coding boot camps, tailored for beginners with no prior technical or coding knowledge. The courses are thorough, and cover in-demand skills to prepare our graduates for a successful career in the tech industry. We've designed the training to fit around your personal schedule. Students choose when they want to study, have access to their boot camp 24 hours a day, and can enroll anytime. Coding boot camps are intensive training programs in technology. The Tech Academy offers many coding boot camps to choose from, and each specializes in a popular skill set, such as web development, computer programming, artificial intelligence development, cybersecurity, mobile app development, data science, design, video game development, and more. With so many coding boot camps to choose from, here is what makes us different. One, we are the most flexible boot camp in the world. Students can enroll any day of the year, set their own study schedules, and work through their courses at their own speed. As a self-paced school, you can quickly move through topics you're already familiar with and spend more time on new subjects. Our courses fit around your life, not the other way around. Two, the curriculum is beginner friendly. This is important because some other code schools require that students pass a coding exam 
or study extra data before classes start. But with the Tech Academy, as long as you can read, write, and perform basic math, addition, subtraction, etc., you can enroll. We start from the bottom up, building on fundamental terms and concepts related to computers and technology, and advancing from there. We assume no prior technical knowledge on the part of the student, and beginners, as well as those who have past experience, are welcome. While some other schools focus on only one or two tools and skills, our coding boot camps cover a wide array of topics. We have decades of experience in the tech industry and know what the expected knowledge base is. It extends beyond just knowing how to code in one language or being able to perform one action. So instead of pigeonholing you into only one or two specialties, we will teach you dozens of languages, skills, and tools to ensure you're a well-rounded tech professional with a large skill set, thereby enhancing your career prospects. We are one of the original coding boot camps and have been around since 2014. Online, you can find us on every major best coding boot camp list. We've received hundreds of industry awards and there's thousands of positive reviews from our students and graduates. We have a proven track record and aren't going anywhere. And last, but far from least, our boot camps are priced affordably. Even though we are one of the most highly rated schools in our industry, Tech Academy boot camps cost less than the national average. We also offer multiple tuition payment options, from upfront discounts to monthly payments. We made our boot camps budget friendly, so they are accessible to the largest number of individuals possible. The Tech Academy has graduated over a thousand students that are now working in the tech industry, with most making an average pay rate of over $60,000 a year in their first job. In addition to our boot camps, we have published several books and a dictionary, and we deliver corporate training to companies. As I mentioned earlier, there are no set start dates. So if you feel the Tech Academy is the right school for you, you can enroll today. I hope you do. Thanks for watching. So thank you for watching that. I wanna lay down some expectations about what this class is and what is it, what it isn't, just so you can know um, what's happening as we go through. One of the biggest things is that as we go through this, I'm gonna be defining a lot of really complex coding and computer terms as we go through, defining them as simply as I can, which is something we've put a lot of work into over the years. And I think you'll be happy with how we do on that. One thing I wanna point out is as we go through this and I start defining some terms and illustrating some of the, you know, the concepts, at first, there might seem to be no direct connection between some of the terms and concepts, but I assure you, the farther we get into this, the more you'll see it all fitting together. And what we're trying to do is remove some mystery about some of the more complex aspects of computer programming, how computers work together, software development, what it looks like, just to be able to make the world of technology you know, that much more understandable and approachable for you. In addition to defining a lot of these technical words, I'm gonna teach you a lot of important concepts and data We'll cover things like the fundamentals of computer programming, right? Now, you should know this is not the only workshop that I'm ever gonna do. It would, in fact, be impossible to cover all coding terms and concepts in one workshop. So there will be many more of these in the future, but I do guarantee that you'll leave this presentation with more knowledge than you started with, and hopefully some mysteries about computers and technology totally eradicated. Now, I wanna be clear, this is not a coding class, meaning we're not gonna be writing code. I am gonna be holding an intro to coding class this Saturday, actually. So if you're interested in attending that, my assistant is gonna paste the link in the chat. You should have seen that pop up just now. And that's a free class that you can register for. And in this class, we're gonna cover some of the data that's vital for you to become a competent coder. And frankly, virtually every introductory coding class and boot camp outside of the Tech Academy does not teach the kind of things that I'm gonna go over with you tonight. So there we go. We're gonna cover common terms, fundamental programming concepts. You're not gonna write code, but we do have a free coding class coming up that I think you'll absolutely love. And with that, let's get this thing started. And I'm gonna go ahead and load up the workshop now. Here's the agenda. We're gonna cover everything about what's called the application lifecycle. This is essentially how computer programs get made. Then we're gonna cover the different sort of data types that programs work with. What sort of data do they work with? To a computer, knowing the kind of data that it is receiving 
and and what kind of things can be done with that data is super critical. Next, we're going to look at what's called a client server arrangement. This is just one example. This is just one example of the way computer programs work, sorry, the way computers work together, but it's super common and once you understand this, a lot of how your computers at work, you know, in your place of work will cooperate becomes clear. A lot about how the internet works will become clear. Next, we're going to cover a specific word. We're going to cover a specific word called stack. Now there are multiple definitions. There's multiple definitions for stack. And it's a pretty interesting word when you start to break into it. So I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy that. I hope you will too. Then we're going to cover some central concepts around databases and what's called S SQL. SQL means structured query language. All that will become clear. And finally, we're going to look at some different types of applications. There's a lot of different types of programs. We're going to cover what those types are and what they might be used for. And then we'll have some final words about advice on how you can break into technology. So let's get started. Now, when you look at this diagram and this definition, when you look at this diagram, this definition may initially seem confusing. A lot of schools might just leave you with this definition and have you get as much as you can out of it. If they even covered what this application lifecycle management thing is at all. But at the Tech Academy, we break down every part of a complex definition and we define technical terms quite simply. So let's just go ahead and do that, starting with this first word, application. An application is just a computer program. Now we're gonna cover in a little while here what the fund fundamental parts of a computer program are. But essentially, it's just a set of instructions that a computer understands and can execute. And of course, we use them all the time. You're probably using 20 or 30 of them right now on your actual laptop or desktop or your phone or your watch, all kinds of different devices. They've all got computer programs. That's all an application is. It's just a computer program. Lifecycle, this is a pretty cool concept. This is the full cycle from beginning to end of a thing. A process has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It starts... Some work gets done and it stops. So what we're looking here, you can kind of see we're honing in on it is for computer programs, what does that start, get some work done and stop cycle look like? What does that beginning to end process look like? And there's so much to know inside there and understanding it can open up a lot of clarity surrounding the software industry. When we look at management. That's just running a process or a project. Testing is taking whatever features you expect to be there and verifying they're there, verifying proper operation, testing with incorrect inputs, essentially making sure something operates correctly. Then there's operations. Got them in the wrong order. I apologize for that. Development is actually building the thing, right? How do you create something? What's that process look like? And then deployment. That means taking a computer program and putting it out in the environment where it's meant to be used. Now, let me clarify all of this. Well, we've got all these things on the screen. We're going to cover this in some detail, but I just want to start out with a basic understanding. When you look at the process of making computer, when you look at the process of making computer programs, it all starts with an idea. And from that idea, you have to design what's it going to look like in its finished form. You haven't built anything yet. You haven't written any code, but you're going to start to design what does that idea look like in the real world? And you document all that. Then you actually build it. You write the code. You make whatever computer program or part of a computer program represents that idea, brings that idea to fruition. Then you test it to make sure that one, it actually does what you said it was supposed to do. And two, that it behaves how it's supposed to, even when people try to use it improperly, which will happen. 
guaranteed. Then once you're done testing it, now you have to deploy it. You have to put it out into the actual environment where the actual end users can take advantage of it. And finally, you have to maintain it over time. And that's what operations is all about. So while I've got the order wrong here and I apologize for that, that's the sequence that we're looking at in terms of computer programs. So here's these terms. An application is just a program. The life cycle is the beginning to end of something. Management is just running or executing a thing. Development means building it. Testing means testing it. Um, and then one of the biggest ones is deploying it, you know, getting it out to where the users can access it, and then operating it. Now, another point, just to clarify things about software development. Of all of these things, the one that's most expensive for an organization is the final one, operations. If you look at the actual manpower and expenditure of resources by a company, both materiel and money, you might spend a lot of money to make software. Software is expensive to make and it can take a little while. But that pales in comparison to what it costs to maintain a useful piece of software over time. So just a thing to know about software development. It also helps with job security. All right, so now, if we look at this definition again, application lifecycle management, we've covered all these terms. These application lifecycle management tools, they're software applications. So they are programs that help you make programs. These tools, these application lifecycle management tools, they are applications that help big organizations manage the entire application lifecycle from the conception of the idea all the way through to operating it and even retiring a computer program. Often they have features for requirements gathering, design, development, testing, deployment, and operations like we talked about. And I hope now that this definition of application lifecycle management makes a lot more sense. So that's application lifecycle management, a set of procedures and tools to manage the process of gather requirements, design the application, develop the application, test it, deploy it, and maintain it over time. So there we go. All right, now, again, this will all unite everything we're gonna cover in the rest of the presentation. I want you to know about a few of the more popular application lifecycle management software uh, programs that are out there just in case you encounter them, so you know what they are. Microsoft has an application called Azure DevOps that can manage that entire process I just described. One of the big competitors, IBM, has a very similar piece of software called Rational that covers, it has tools for managing the entire process from ideation all the way through to operations and beyond. Another huge player in this space is a company called Atlassian and for those of you who are familiar at all with working in the technology industry, you probably heard of Jira. Jira is an application lifecycle management software um, that most engineers are uh, familiar with because when you get given a task to do as a software engineer, this is one of the most common pieces of software where you will go to find the tasks that you have to work on on the day-to-day, week-to-week basis. So that, again, that whole concept for the last couple, three slides is all about application lifecycle management. This is both the process of managing the whole system and software that helps you manage that process. So when we say ALM, application lifecycle management, we mean the actual very human work of managing this and also these specialized pieces of software, examples of which you see on the screen, that are used to manage this whole process. All right. Now let's move on. And again, it's gonna seem like a jump, but there is a connection here, I assure you. So this gentleman you see on the screen is George Boole. Now, George Boole lived about 150, 160 years ago. And he actually lived before the first computers were even designed or built. But the work he did in logic forms the foundation for every single computing device in the world. And here's what he did specifically. He, set, he defined a system of logic that was not a gradient. Like gradient scales of logic are, you know, all the way wrong, 
a little bit less wrong, about halfway between right and wrong, a little bit more right, and all the way right. You can get the idea of a graduated scale of logic. That's not what George Boole put together. He defined a system that could only include wrong or right, true or false, and various combinations of those. Now, you might be asking, what is logic and some dude that lived 150 years ago have to do with computers? Well, one of the most fundamental things we built the computers for is to help us in automating decision-making. The fundamental purpose of a computer is to take in data, work with that data in some way, and to send that data on somewhere else. And when we get to that middle part of work with that data in some way, one of the primary tools that we have, and one of the main reasons we made computers at all, like I said, is we want it to make decisions for us. So how do we relate this to this George Boole guy? Well, you'll see these sort of odd Venn diagram things on here. And this represents a subset, just a small, small picture of how this Boolean logic thing worked. Again, he designed a logic system that could only work with two, piece, two types of data, a true and a false. In computers, we can even call that a one and a zero, where one is true and zero is false. One is yes and zero is no. You get the idea. There's polarities here. Now, how does this come in helpful? Well, let's say that you actually had, and this is a totally made up idea, just bear with me. You had a computer, uh, a website where you could apply to run for president of the United States. Well, those of you who are familiar with your high school civics lessons know that there's only three qualifications to be able to run for president. You have to be at least 35 years of age, be a natural born citizen, and you must have lived in the United States for at least 14 years. All three have to be true. It's not like there's any wiggle room. There's no gradient scale. It is cut and dry. Now, it turns out that that's the kind of way we want computers to work. We do not want to deal with ambiguity in computers. We want simply very defined yes or no. So if you were writing a program and it took in, you know, for this purpose of, am I allowed to run for president? All it would ask is three things. What's your age? Are you a national born citizen? And have you lived in the United States for at least 14 years? That's all it would ask. Wouldn't ask anything else. And then you would take those inputs and you'd run them through Boolean logic. And you would say, well, the age question is age greater than 35 years. I'm going to call that mm, A. Is this person a natural born citizen? I'm going to call this B. And has this person lived in the United States for at least 14 years? I'm going to call that C. And you would run it through a piece of code that says if A and B and C, therefore allowed to run for president. And that word and has a very specific definition. It is an example of a Boolean operator, a way to take this logic system George Boole created and use it in how computers work. Now, I know I'm belaboring the point a little bit on this, but what you're looking at on the screen is critical to understanding both how computers work and how engineers think. We don't deal with ambiguity. Computers don't deal with it. And all too often, engineers kind of break when you give them ambiguous data. And this is part of why modern computers run on this logic system. One more example, uh, a couple more. There's a Boolean operator, another one besides the AND operator, that's called the OR. And this means something's true if either or, it's either A or B is true. So as an example, let's say you had a big, long academic research paper and you built some computer code to scan through it and you were interested in meteors. But you also know that very often people refer to meteors as meteorites. Now, you may be a real meteor nerd and know the difference. I'll be honest, I'm not perfectly certain what the difference is, but I know that it's probably easy to confuse. So you have this big 30,000 you know, um, word long research paper. You can write some code that's searching for every example of when people wrote either meteor or meteorite and you want to find every spot in the document. 
That is an example of a Boolean OR operator. Your computer program would scan through that document and it would go ding, i.e. it would evaluate to true every time it found either the word Meteor or the word Meteorite. Now, hopefully if you're thinking about like the, primary, the, the purpose of a computer, which again is to take in data, work with it in some fashion and then send it on, you can see that these kind of operations would be really valuable in working with data. Last one, this not example. This will give you a true simply by virtue of reversing something from false to true or true to false. Here's an example. How old do you have to be to buy alcohol? Well, in almost all of America, I think everywhere now by federal law, you have to be at least 21. So you could write some code that says if age is greater than or equal to 21, then someone's allowed to buy alcohol. Or you could write the exact same thing and say, if not age greater than 20, you can't buy alcohol. It's two sides of the same coin. It's just two different ways to work with this logic. The point I want to make out of all of this stuff is that what you're looking at, again, is fundamental to how computers operate. Every single operation you're going to use inside a computer will ultimately make a decision of some sort. And it's this logic we use called Boolean logic that allows us to make those decisions. All right, let's move on. Now, we're building computer programs. And again, <laughs> I'm going to harp on this a lot because it's so important. The purpose of a computer is to take in data process that data in some way and then send the data on somewhere. Now we could talk about that all night long, but let's just pay attention to that middle part. If the purpose is to, of the computer is to process data, what kinds of data will it work with? So you can see on the screen here, a few different data types, integer, character, string, Boolean, arrays, and date time. Now, we're going to go into a little bit of specifics on each of these. We've already covered Boolean a little bit. These are all examples of different types of data. But before we go even a, a moment farther, I want to clarify that with a computer, when you're talking about different data types, you're not just talking about the kind of data they represent. So for example, if we look at an integer, which happens to represent numeric data, numbers, amounts of things, quantities, right? But a data type encompasses two factors. The first one is what kind of data is represented. And the second one, which is of equal importance, is what kind of things can you do with that data? I'll give you an example to help differentiate these. On the screen here, you see an integer data type. Again, that's a whole number, right? That's a number without any fractions, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 not 1.7 and 2.34 and five and a thirds. Those are not integers. So again, an integer is a whole number. What are the kinds of things you can do with a number? Well, you can do add, subtract, multiply, divide, all the math things that we enjoyed so much in school, right? So now let's look at a different type of data, a string. This is just numbers and letters. It's actually what you see on, this, on the screen underneath the little symbol. It says S-T-R-I-N-G. That's an example of a string. Now, it shouldn't be a shock to you at all that computers work with strings a lot because we read written information. So, where am I going with this? Well, I said that a data type encompasses both the kinds of data that you'll work with and what the work is that you can do. So, you can't do math with strings but you can do string related or writing related things. You can take a string and make all the letters capital. You can take a string and split it apart and put a hyphen in the middle. You can take a string and make everything lowercase. You can make it bold. You can make it italic. There's so many things you can do with string data, but math is not one of them. You can't, you can't write down Wednesday plus rowboat equals. The computer doesn't know what to do with that because math is not one of the types of operations 
that a string data type has. Now, again, some of this is going to be very obvious to you because it represents the way things work in the real world. You aren't going to write down on a board at school when you're doing some kind of math quiz, Wednesday plus rowboat equals question mark. We know that implicitly. But computers don't know anything implicitly. They're just machines. They can't think. And so when you tell a computer what data type you're giving it, you also need to tell it what are the things you can do with this data. So now that we know that, the type of data and the operations, the next several concepts we go through should make even more sense. So here's a data type called float. Where I said an integer is a whole number. You see it on the right there, 182. A float is a number with a decimal point. In other words, you have some fraction of a whole number included. So this could be 1.82. It could be 3.14156 or whatever pi is. It goes out a long way. It could be five and a thirds. These are all floats. We use this type of data when we need more precision in our quantities. So there's another data type. Now, I'm going to go through several data types here that are almost universal in computers. And then I'm going to show you some that aren't universal that make it really fun to be a programmer. Let's move on to the next. Oh, actually, let's talk about the string one. I apologize. So here's a really important thing to understand about working with computers when you're working with text data. And by the way, the specific term for the kind of data there is in a string is alphanumeric. It's a combination of alphabetical characters like A, B, C, D, E, F, G and number characters. One, two, three, four, five. And it also includes like special punctuation symbols, you know, the hashtag, the ampersands. That's all quote unquote alphanumeric data. So I very often, most computer programmers just say text data, but the precise term is alphanumeric data. So let's look at this string. This string has alphanumeric data in it. It has the word example in it. Notice how the one specific letter in there, X, has been called out and we see the word character under it. There's actually two different data types involved here. A computer can work with individual characters. They're still alphanumeric. Or it can work with a set or a collection of alphanumeric characters that is all considered one thing. So there's a little conceptual shift you need to make here. The string here is a collection of individual characters. But as that collection, you, you can do different things with it that you can do with a character. What can you do with a character? Well, you can make it uppercase or lowercase. It's about it. Not a lot you can do. What can you do with a string? Well, you can add more characters to it. You can split it apart. You can remove one specific character. There's a lot of things you can do that you can't do with an individual character. So... Again, I stress this because lots of the work we use computers for involves text or alphanumeric data. And there's two different types of data involved there. A character and a string. And by the way, very often in a lot of the computer programming languages you'll encounter, that data, data type called a string is abbreviated STR for string. And the one that throws people off <laughs> in terms of pronunciation is that the data, data type called a character is very often abbreviated C-H-A-R. And because of that, people call it char because it comes off the tongue a lot more easily than care. It, it's care data. doesn't really work that much. It still just means character, one individual alphanumeric item. All right, so now let's move on to another data type you're going to encounter a lot, arrays. This is fun, and this is where I want you to just pay very close attention for a couple of reasons. One, hopefully we'll clear up some misunderstandings, add to your knowledge, and this will be helpful. But more importantly, this is just a personal thing. If you find that learning exactly how this thing works in front of you on the screen, if you find that learning how it works is fun, programming might be for you. 
So let's break this down a little bit. What we've got here is clearly a collection of individual characters. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can see them. But what you're actually looking at is a different data type than a string. The fact is the data you see collected here, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, might very well be data of a different type. It could be of numbers. You could have the numbers 1, 7, 32, 48, negative 11 could be in there. It could be strings instead of individual characters. It could be, you know, the first, instead of A, it could say, you know, horse. The next one says cow. The next one says sheep, whatever. The point is an array is a collection of data. And that data is of another type. So an array is a collection of data. That's the first thing you want to look at. So for this example, just to kind of make it easy to talk through, we happen to have used character data. So this array is a collection of individual characters. But again, I want to stress each of those items in the boxes, they could be a different data type. They could be integers. They could be floats. They could be strings. They could even be Boolean results. True, false, 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 true, true, false. So let's move on to the next layer of complexity. When we're looking at this array, a collection of data type, a collection of data, a lot of what I'm about to tell you relates to the kinds of things you can do with an array. Let's say you had a collection of items in the real world, like you had shelves that you were going to stock at a grocery store. There's a collection of items that people can buy. Well, you would want to be able to add items to this collection at any point in the collection. In other words, you want to be able to walk up to the shelf and make a little space and put another product in there. Or you want to be able to walk to the end of the shelf and add another product there. Or walk to the beginning of the shelf and put another product there. Those are the kinds of operations you'd want to do with a shelf full of goods, full of product. And arrays are exactly that. So if that's what we want to be able to do with them, remove items from it, add items at the end, add items at the beginning, or add items in between, if those are the kinds of operations, we have to have a common language for describing the structure of this object in front of us and how to do these things. Well, how does that work? So look at the numbers zero through seven that are in that light blue background. These are called indices. Now, most people don't say indices. They say indexes. But if you can be all nerdy about language, which I kind of am, the plural of index is indices. What is an index? It is the position within this overall collection that you are looking at. You're looking at a specific part or item in this collection. Each of the items in the collection is called an element. So you can clearly see an example on there. The element in the array at the index of five happens to have data in the element that's equal to the character G. Now, let's do another one. What character data happens to be in the element at an index of three? It's D. You can see the index right above it. It says three. Look inside the element, you see the character D. Now, what can make arrays more valuable, but a little more challenging to work with is, like I said at the beginning of this, the type of data in these elements doesn't necessarily need to be character data. What if it's numbers? And this is part of why I said what I said at the beginning. If you find this interesting, fun, and challenging, then you might want to think about being a programmer because it's very common that the data type in those elements, in those boxes, if you will, is numeric data. And so now you're forced to deal with the weird factor of perhaps the element, the element at index six, which in this instance happens to have 
character data in it that's equal to G. What if the data inside that element was numeric and what if it was equal to the number five? And so now when you're scanning through this array trying to find the right data, if you're looking at the data, you would hit number five, but then you look to where its position is in that six and it's really easy to get confused. So it's just a thing to know that the array is one of the most fundamental data structures in computing, super valuable, but because the types of data in each of these elements could be all sorts of things, any data type available, really, it can be very fun and challenging to work with these collections. That's all. So that's an array. What do we use these for? Well, you need collections of things all the time. Let's say you had a computer program that helped you run schools. You would need to have a student roster. That's a collection of students. So you would have an array that has every student inside it. And if you wanted to add a new student, you could decide to add them at the very end of the array or find the array position relating to the, you know, where they are alphabetically and put them in at the right alphabetical position, all sorts of things. And by the way, it's another thing you can do with these, these elements in the array is you can reorder them. What if we didn't like that the one on the screen happened to be alphabetical and we wanted to do reverse alphabetical, H through A? What if it was numbers and we wanted to have them be high to low? And again, this stuff comes up because you can think of probably instances when you're working with real world objects where you want to sort them to be alphabetical, either, you know, to be numerical, either ascending or descending. The same is true in the physical, inside the computer is what's, you know, true in the physical world. So that's enough on arrays. Hope that helps. Now, we're looking at another more complex type of, of data when we look at this type of data called a class. So let's spend a little bit of time on this. We could talk about this for hours, but we're gonna be very, very brief. Again, it's a lot on the screen here, just bear with me. A data type has both its structure and what you can do with it. In the previous examples, the structure and what you can do with it is pretty much defined by the computer. Every computer programming language that's mature at all has the data types integer, float, string, boolean, character, arrays, all these things. And it was figured out decades ago, stably accepted all over the world, what the structure and operations of those data types are classes this is where you get to come in as a programmer and you make it up but because you make it up you've got to understand those two fundamental things there's the structure of a thing and there's the kinds of work it can do the kinds of operations available to it again with an array the structure is a collection of items in you know in where the indexes are in uh, ascending order. And you can do things like reorder them, add one, subtract one. That's what you can do. It's structure and behavior. Now, when we look at classes, you as a programmer get to invent these. So on the left, we have the invention of a thing called a car. Now, this is not 100% a programming example, but just to illustrate this, although you could write a computer program that worked with cars and you would have this exact example. This next concept is a jump for some people. So I'm gonna go slow because I wanna make sure I give you as much care factor as possible on this. When you as a programmer are describing or writing down in code what your quote unquote class is, you're playing a big game of what if. And here's what I mean is, if I were to have a car, I don't yet, but if I were to have a car, what would the structure of it be? And what sort of behaviors could it have? If I were to have one, 
I don't have one yet. So, what we call those in computer programming is what are the properties, that's its structure and appearance, and behaviors, that's the kinds of things it can do. So when we look at this example you know, on the slide, we're saying if we were to have a car, it could have things like who's the manufacturer, how many doors does it have, what color is it, what type of you know, model is it, all these things. What could it do? Well, a car can accelerate, it can decelerate, it can brake, it can steer. Those are all behaviors. So, again, thing I'm trying to stress is when you're dealing with a class, you haven't made one yet. You're saying, if I were to have one, these are the kind of appearance it would have, you know, its properties, and this is what it could do. And you put that into a computer program, and then all of a sudden your program needs one of them. Let's illustrate this next concept by looking at the, uh, the, the gray box there that says room number, room rent, room status. This is an example if you were creating a class called, say, a room, a hotel room. What you would care about if you had one was, what's the number of the specific room? What does it cost? Is it actually booked? The kind of behaviors you would care about with a room if you needed one is, can I check someone in? Can I check them out? And can I get the status of the room? Those are all behaviors. And again, this is so weird, but it's so important for programming. We're describing this, but we don't have a room yet. So you build a computer program that's all about helping a hotel manage their rooms. And then they install this program at their brand new hotel. They just built it. They're about ready to open. And they have to go in and they have to put into this computer program what they're actually dealing with in their building. They've got 100 rooms. And they've got to go into your computer program and say, all right, I'm starting with a blank slate. I don't have any rooms. I'd like to put them in my first room, please. And you have built them a nice little screen where they can put in what the room number is and what the rent is and is it rented? So let's just picture that in the real world because there's an important computing concept here. There they are at this screen. They see the form and they put in room number one. Rent is $105 a night and they haven't opened yet. So they put the status is it's not rented and they click create. And this is where magic happens. You as the programmer have made this thing called a class. It is a quote unquote room class. But in the computer program that's running, no examples of it exist. But they click create and the program looks to your definition of what this room class is. It takes their information and it makes a room. It magically comes into being inside your computer program and it's being tracked. It's room number one for $105 a night and it's not being rented and then they go through and enter all the other rooms and then they open the doors and someone walks in the door and they say i'd like to rent room number one and so you pull up room number one in the computer program and you now are accessing behavior you check someone into that room and now its status changes so this is a pretty real world example you can see that a computer program to manage hotels would need to do something like this the whole point of all of this is that the previous data types that I covered are built into almost every computer program. Sorry, almost every computer on earth. This one is not. You as the programmer get to create these. You create a class. And when you need an, an example of that class, you create what's called an object. A real example of the thing. This is our room number one in this silly example. Another word for that object when you create something from a class, it's called an instance of the class. And that instance has all the properties and behaviors that you designed. All right, let's move on here. This is, in, 
more examples of instances. You could have a class that is a building class. And you could have a specific instance, which is the Empire State Building. You could have an, you know, a, a dog class. An instance would be Lassie, or it would be um, you know, a, a Rottweiler. You could have a class that's called a computer class. A specific instance might be your, your actual computer, your laptop. Even your mobile phone is a computer. So we could talk about this again all night. Let's go on to a few more things. Here's another common uh, type of data inside computer programs that you get to control. It's called a dictionary. And a dictionary is a collection of what are called key value pairs. A key is a unique identifier. That means in a specific dictionary item, you can only have one example of a key. Like you look at the key on this top one and it says Alice. That's the key. And the value is 30. That's her age. This means in this collection, you can't have another Alice. Because that's the key. Another example down below is what is an animal's favorite meat? In this example, the type of animal is the key. And then the value is what is ever, whatever is after it. If you've already listed animal, sorry, if you've already listed lion in your dictionary and given it a favorite you know, food, you can't then farther down in the same dictionary list lion again. Why? Because this go back, goes back to the beginning of what we're talking about tonight. Computers do not deal with ambiguity. Which lion do you mean? If you include it twice, a computer cannot figure out which one you quote unquote meant. It deals with specifics. Is this the exact data or not? And when it isn't exact, a computer breaks. The program doesn't work. All right. So all these things we're talking about at the beginning, Booleans, characters, you know, integers, floats, arrays, these are all native data types. They're built into most programming languages. They're also called primitive types. The user-defined types are the second ones I talked about. Classes, dictionaries. And these are, you get to create both their structure and their behavior. And that's what a lot of computer programming is about. Because you're building that thing, this class or whatever, or this dictionary, based on a real-world problem that you're trying to solve. And real-world problems have their own structure and behavior. And you've got to represent that inside your computer program. All right, now... Another switch. This is going to be fun. So, here's the internet and the World Wide Web. To be very, very crystal clear really quickly, the internet is a collection of linked computers and a set of agreements about how information can be exchanged between the computers. That's what the internet is. The web is a collection of linked electronic documents. They call those documents web pages. So again, the internet is hardware. It's a bunch of connected computers. That's what the internet is. And the web is a collection of documents that are all linked together in various ways. That's web pages. So why do we care about this? Well, what you're looking at on the screen here, I could do an entire workshop dedicated to this subject. So I'm going to do rapid definitions here. Okay. The web browser that you see on the left, that is owned by Bob in Topeka, Kansas. This web browser is just a computer program on his computer. That computer has, of course, an operating system like Windows or Mac or Linux, but you've installed this web browser like Chrome or Firefox, or if you hate yourself, Edge. So this browser, its job is to deal with the web, which means that we're gonna be very simple about it if we said that the web is a collection of linked electronic documents, then a browser's job is to request a document that's somewhere out in the world and get that document to come to the computer it's on, Bob's computer in Topeka, Kansas, and use that document to make a display on Bob's monitor. That's what a web browser does. It does that by issuing special requests to specialized computers. They call them web servers. This is where all the files are. Again, I know this is a simplistic explanation, but it's very true. The web is a collection of linked electronic documents. And so if we want a specific web page, a web page is just an electronic document, 
then we send a request to the specific computer where that file is, that electronic document. They call that a web server. So look at that web server on the right. It's just a physical computer. It's got an operating system. It's got a bunch of files and folders and it has a very specialized computer program called the web server. That web server is there waiting for requests. It says, hey, I'm here. If you need a specific electronic document, just send me a properly formatted request and I'll give it to you. And that's what you see going back and forth. This, remember I said the internet is hardware, you know, a bunch of connected computers and agreements on how to transfer different types of data between them. Web pages are one type of data. And the agreement on how to transfer web pages between computers is called the hypertext transfer protocol. That's what HTTP means in this diagram. So it, all it means is if the browser can make a request that is in alignment with this protocol, this agreement about how to deal with web pages, if it can make a properly formatted request and send it to the program, sorry, to the computer where the file it once is, where the web page it once is, then that receiving computer will find it and send it to them. That's how it works underneath the hood, right? So other definitions here you need to know about are HTML. It means hypertext markup language. That is the language we write these electronic documents in. Web pages. That's all it is. A web page is just a text file. There's nothing magical about it at all. You write a bunch of text formatted the right way and save it on a computer. In this case, you save it on a web server. And then it's sitting there waiting for a request to come in for it. And when it's requested and then sent back to the browser that asked for it, the browser knows how to read through this stuff you wrote down called HTML. And based on what's in that, make something display on your screen, which is something we're all using right now in real time. And it can happen very rapidly, clearly. All right, so that's HTTP requests. And I hope that helped. Now, this is a little more expansive information about this, but it illustrates not just how the web works, but a whole computer program system. If you look here on the left, you have the browser. It's on somebody's computer. We're gonna call that computer the client computer. Then we have the request going in and it goes to a server. It receives the re this HTTP request. Now, if the thing that's being asked for goes beyond just, hey, give me this file, please. If the thing that's being asked for requires some work to be done, now we need to involve another computer. We've got to involve a computer that can do work. We call that an application server. The web server, this HTTP server in this diagram, its job is just to serve up files that already exist. But what if we need to do some work before we can create the files? What if we need to figure out who the, you know, the current inventory level for a product is before we can send that information back to the, to the browser? That's where the application server comes in. And finally, what if the work that needs to be done requires accessing persistent data that we've stored? Data that's safe from loss. In other words, data that's in a database. So what you're looking at here is the whole system for the front end of an application out in the client's browser, which is the interface that our users can see. The web server that can handle just simple retrieval of pre you know, already created you know, HTML files. And then an application server where our specialized program that can do real work for us when needed lives and a database server where a stored collection of permanent data can live. And this little system here is where a lot of engineers live somewhere in this system. Some engineers work on the whole thing. Some specialize in one aspect of it, but that's what we're looking at here. All right, good. Now, a brief note on data structures because we've covered a little bit about this. There's a lot of different ways to structure data. You know, whether it's an array or whether it's these classes that you can create. But one thing is always true. There's the structure, i.e. how the different pieces of the, 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 the structure are connected, right? 
and there's the behavior. What can they do? So keep these two things in mind because what you'll encounter in lots of different areas where you're, you're, you're creating computer programs is you're going to deal with sometimes simple and sometimes complex structures of data, but you'll know two things stably. One, first find out how the data is structured, how it's organized relative to other parts of, of, of the structure. And secondly, find out what operations you can do with it. And if you'll attack it from that perspective, the two separate aspects, you can start to eliminate a lot of confusion. All right. Now I'm going to talk about one specific data structure. I know we're getting a little long here. Stick around, please. I super appreciate it. Hopefully you're enjoying this. So I said there were two definitions of the word stack. The first one relates to a data structure. This is an ordered collection of items and a stack has a very specific behavior or type of operation that controls how you add items to it. And you can see that if you're going to add an item, you have to put it newest on top. And that's what you see in operations one, two, three, four, and five. And then we see below that how you're able to remove items from it. Now, what's a real world example here? Let's say you run a grocery store and you're stocking the milk aisle. You know, you know customers will come up and they're going to grab the first jug of milk. But you do not want them to get old milk. And so you instruct your stock people, listen, normally you'd go around from behind and you would just put some milk in and go all the way to the front up against the glass so it's the first thing people see. And then you would put some more in behind it. I don't want you to do it that way. I want you to go out in front of the glass and I want you to open the door and start pushing milk in from the front. And that way, the customer is guaranteed to get the newest milk when they walk up. That's an example of a stack. Picture Eric, here I am, and I'm a stalker. <laughs> that sounded great. I'm a food stalker. I work in the dairy department and I've got a big old pallet of milk and I open up the door and I push 10 gallons of milk in there. And then customers start coming by. When they open that door, the only one they're allowed to take is the most recent one. Why do I care about this though? What does milk have to do with computers? There's many times when you are handling different types of data on a computer where you want work to be done on the last item that you added to a collection. You don't want to have it like a grocery queue where you handle the first item. You want it to be the most recent one added. And so they have this object called a stack. Now, again, we could talk about a bunch of nerdy computer science stuff for an hour or so in here. The main reason I want you to know this definition is so that you can understand this definition. I showed you this diagram before, but I want to explain this diagram within the context of a wonderful definition for a stack. Forget everything I just said about a data structure called a stack with the push and the pop. A stack and understanding what it is is super important to being a, a developer. A stack is a set of software that you need to have a complete platform to host your computer programs. In other words, it's everything you need beside your program that you wrote so that your program has a place to live. I know that's a really casual, informal definition. So I'm going to read out the exact strict one. But this is what it boils down to. What are all the things you need besides your computer program so you, your computer program can live? 
here's the strict nerdy definition. A stack is a set of software subsystems or components needed to create a complete platform such that no additional software is needed to support applications. So let's look at this diagram here and see how that fits. First thing to know is where does your computer program fit in all this? Well, there's a bunch of programs already in use here and none of them are the ones you wrote. There's only one place you put the ones that you wrote. Look on the left there with Bob in Topeka, Kansas. There's a browser on his laptop. That's a computer program, but you don't need to write that one. Look at the HTTP server. There's a computer program running there. It's called a web server. That's a piece of, that's a, that's a computer program. You don't need to write that. It's already written for you. The database server. There's a computer program on there called a database server. It controls access to stored data. You don't need to write that. It's already been done for you. Now let's look at the app server, the application server. That's where your program goes. It lives right in there. All the other parts of this system, you can rely for the most part on computer programs written by other people, which is pretty cool. But it also means that right there on that application server is where you make your money. It's where you use your mind to solve difficult problems. It's where you write your computer programs that are the whole reason we're even talking. So let's look at this concept of stack again. All the things that you need to have a complete platform such that no additional software is needed. Well, I kind of just led you through a bunch of them. Let's take a look at an example here. You need something on the front end, which is when we talk about the web, where people are going to see the user interface, how they interact with your whole system. You need something on the back end, which is your application. You need a database. And you need some kind of web server. Let's get a little more precise, though. This is a specific stack. And again, this is everything you need besides your computer program so that your computer program has a place to live. The LAMP stack stands for, as you can see, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. So, let's go back here. And look at where your computer program is going to live. It's going to live on this app server. So, what does your program need? Bearing in mind, you're going to install your program on that app server. Well, you do need a web server because your application is going to receive requests to do work. And those requests will come from a browser into the web server. And then if the web server has anything beyond just simply find a file and send it back, if it needs any work done, it's going to send the request on to your computer program. So you got to have a web server. You need an operating system. Wherever your computer program is installed, one of the main things an operating system like Windows or Linux or Mac OS is there for is it allows your custom programs to be installed. We do it all the time. You install Microsoft Word. You install a browser. You install any kind of computer program you're installing on your computer. You're only able to install it because the operating system has a facility for doing so. So you got to have an operating system. You also need a database program so that you can actually access persistent stored data. And you need a computer programming language to write your program in. These are the four things that you cannot do without. If any one of these isn't present, your program can't exist. And that's why they call it a stack. Now in this example, Linux is the operating system that allows you to install your computer program in the first place. Apache is the web server that can handle the incoming requests. MySQL is the database management program that lets you access your database. And PHP 
is the computer programming language you would write your custom program in that did all this fancy dancy work. So this is a stack. Now, once you have all this set up, now you can write your program, in this case, in PHP, install it onto your application server, and the whole system runs. But without any of these pieces, you don't have a place for your computer program to work. So that's a stack. There are other examples of stacks. For example, here's what you do if you're in Windows. Quite often, the operating system is Windows. The database management system is called SQL Server. It's a program you can get from Microsoft. The web server software is called IIS. It stands for Internet Information Services. Fun fact, this is a web server program. And if you're on a Windows machine right now, like I am, this program is already on your computer. You don't have to go through something special to set it up, but you have a, you have a web server program, really powerful, available on your personal computer right now. And then of course, there's what language do you write your computer program in? And this is any of the .NET languages. Now .NET is a collection of computer programming languages. We'll talk about it a bit more, but they all come from Microsoft. It's a bunch of them. The most popular one is called C Sharp. So now you have all four. You have the operating system, Windows. You have the database system. It's called my uh, sorry, SQL Server. You have the web server. It's called IIS or Internet Information Services. And you have a programming language, any of the .NET languages. So now you have a stack and you can write your computer program and it can live somewhere. So these are stacks. How does this relate to the whole subject of the night? Well, programmers and companies specialize quite often in different stacks. You as a programmer might be primarily working in the Windows stack or in the LAMP stack. Computer, big, big companies with lots of engineers might have big pockets of their organization that the engineers only work in the Windows stack or only operate in that LAMP stack or there's several others, right? That's why this matters. It doesn't mean that you, if you know one stack, that you're pigeonholed into working there because the skills do translate, but they don't blend very easily, especially since fundamentally the operating system determines a lot of things and you either have Linux or Windows or Mac OS, and that's all she wrote. All right, so there's a lot of different programming languages. I just mentioned you know, a, a few of them. Some of those popular ones are JavaScript, um, Python, which is super powerful, really easy to learn language, right? C Sharp, I mentioned it already. It comes from uh, Microsoft, very mature, been around for 22 years at this point. And then Java, which has been around for even longer. These are great languages. By the way, the Tech Academy has boot camps specializing in each of these, language, these languages and more. So why are there different programming languages? It has to do with what they were intended to do. Why did they get created in the first place? And we'll discuss that in the, in, in, in next. So one quick note though, databases. This, by the way, is the symbol for a database. And there's a reason why it's this exact symbol when we were first figuring out in the computer industry how to permanently store data. In other words, have data that a computer could use that didn't disappear when you turned the computer off. When we're trying to figure out how to permanently store data, one of the big, most successful solutions at the beginning of, of the industry was huge round disks covered with magnetic material that you could make the magnetic material physically orient one way or the other, one way or the other. And that way we could represent ones and zeros, true and false. You can represent Boolean information, right? And a really big you know, database would use several of these disks stacked on top of each other with a big rod through the middle of them. And that's what this symbol represents is a stacked series of these disks. Again, that isn't how it's done now for the most part, but it's how it was done then. And that's why the symbol came from, right? So... The way that databases work is relatively simple. You have a big collection of data organized in some fashion on this storage device, whether it's a hard drive or whatever it is, you stored it and it's permanent. You can turn the computer off and the data stays there. When you need to use that data, what you'll do is you will define certain criteria, i.e. what is the exact shape 
or form of the data I want to pull out of this big giant collection. What does it look like? Is it all orders that happened after January 1st that were between $5 and $35 that shipped to the, you know, to the East Coast? These are criteria. And the way you get them is you do an operation called querying the database. You send, send specialized instructions into software capable of accessing this big giant collection of data that describes the criteria and says, hey, reach into this big giant collection and only retrieve stuff that meets these criteria. That's how databases work. This is another, oh, I meant to illustrate this. This is um, the inside of a hard drive. You can see there's actually multiple disks inside there. So even today, if you're dealing with a physical hard drive with spinning disks inside it, this is on a much smaller scale what we used to have 50 years ago when databases came around. All right, so if we're going to interact with a database, how do we do it? We do it with a language called SQL. It means structured query language. If we go back to the idea of a database, we have a certain criteria for what we want to extract from this big giant collection of data. And we are going to define what is the structure of the data we want to retrieve look like. Again, is it all orders after January 1st that had a retail price of between $5 and $15 that shipped to the East Coast? That's a structure of data. And you can use this language, SQL, also called SQL, to send that query into a big giant database and retrieve matches. Retrieve that exact data where it matches. So, brief thing on how it works. At the top here, you have the query that you wrote, which could be things like I said, select price, uh, shipping date, you know, select product where price between five and 15 and shipping date after January 1st and shipping location in the following zip codes. You would be able to define, hey, I want everything that is between five and $15 shipped out after January 1st that was shipped to the East Coast. You'd write that down in SQL. That would be received by a special sub-program inside your database uh, software. What are the two examples of database software we've already mentioned? Well, there was MySQL and there was SQL Server. Inside each of those computer programs is a little section called a query language processor. And it goes through what you wrote and breaks it apart. It's called parsing it and figures out from what you wrote, how it's meant to interact with the database. It sends that into a special program that actually has access to the data. It's called a database engine. The database engine actually is allowed to connect to those disks the physical place where the data is stored. And then it does, it reaches into the physical database, retrieves the matching data and sends it to you. And that's a breakdown of how SQL works. All right, now we've already covered uh, what hypertext markup language is briefly before I wanna expand on it a little bit because it's so vital to understand the web and we've covered the web a lot here, right? Remember I said that you have these files you would create where you would fill in a bunch of information that is intended to be used by a browser to create a display. This is what it looks like when you're writing this file and it's just text, there's nothing magical about it. You're gonna create a text file. Like we've created text files a million times. You open up your word processor and you start writing something. This is a text file just like that. It's just that in addition to writing down what you want to have on the screen, like the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog or whatever, you would also include instructions about how you want that content to appear. Do you want it to be bold, italics? Do you want it to be really, really big font, small? Do you want it to be organized in a table? That's what hypertext markup language does. So let's break it apart though. You have the word hypertext. Hypertext is a specific piece of text in a document that links to another document. We use these all day long without thinking about it. It's something on a page that links to a different web page. That's all hypertext is. And it actually doesn't have to be text. It can be an image. How many times do you click on an image and it takes you somewhere, right? That's what hypertext is. It's something on a web page that links to another web page. Markup, let's get a little nerdy for a second. Markup is specialized computer instructions 
that describe the format of content, not the content. What do I mean? Well, I used that silly example a minute ago of the content being the sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. That's the content. Markup would be any instructions on how to display that content. So markup could be what font to display it in on the screen. Whether it's going to be bold, italicized, strike through. Whether it's going to be on the right or the left of the screen. That's all markup. In other words, it's not the content. It's instructions on how to present the content. That's what markup is. And again, we could dive super deep on that. When you learn the history of where that word even came from, it's pretty cool. It's about a 450-year-old word. Even though computers only came around a little while ago. So, when we talk about this thing called hypertext markup language, a markup language is just an agreed way to provide these instructions on how to format your content. That's all a markup language is. So, let's look at this in the context of the web because we've been talking about the web for most of the night, right? If you look on the screen here, you'll see contents right in the middle. Your markup language goes on either side of the content. So, in this weird example, the contents would be the phrase, the phrase, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Great, that's the contents. What's on the beginning and the end of it are these things called tags. If I wanted to, for example, make that sentence be bold, then I would put a bold tag at the beginning and a closing bold tag at the end of it. If I want to be italicized, I would put an opening italics uh, tag at the beginning and then a closing italics tag. And that just tells the browser when it's reading through this document, both the content that should be displayed on the screen and how to display that content. That's all markup language is all about. And it's actually really easy to learn the fundamentals and the basics of this. Um, in fact, we'll be doing a free class on that relatively soon. So there you go. That's hypertext markup language. One of the fundamental aspects of the web and something that engineers work with all the time. Okay. Now, I keep talking about the idea that the computer's purpose is to take in data, process the data in some way, and then send it on. Now, I want to talk about that process part. That's where you write computer programs. And a program, a computer program, no matter how complex, no matter what language is written in, is only composed of five things. We could talk about this for a while. I'm going to be very quick on this just to give you some orientation. The first element of any computer program is an entrance point. What is the first instruction that the computer should execute as soon as you turn on the program? What's the very first thing it's supposed to do? The next element of any computer program is it has to make use of variables. This is essentially a placeholder that you can store data that's going to change while the computer program is running. One piece of data might be the total number of attendees in a Zoom meeting. That is an important piece of information. And it can change while the computer program is running. You would use a variable to store that information. And it would be updated per your instructions in your computer program as the program did its job. Another vital aspect of any computer program is you've got to have what are called control and branching statements or control and branching instructions. This is the classic if this, then that, or if then else. This is how do we give it what we, the instructions that we'd have to execute in the real world, the decisions we'd have to make. How do we make our computer programs do that? And if you don't have that, you haven't really got a program of any value at all. Another key element of any computer program is what are called subprograms. This is a set of instructions that is going to be repeated many times while your computer program runs. For example, it might be that you're quite often going to need to bold an entire paragraph. Well, you could, each time you need to do that as a computer programmer, write, a, write the steps to do that, find the beginning of the paragraph, find the end, go through one character at a time, making each one bold, and then the next time you have to do it, write out those instructions again, or you can make all those instructions into one tiny little package called make it bold, and 
you could set it off to the side as a sub program. And then every time you needed to have that action done, you just pull in the sub program and have it run. The whole point is without the ability to have sub programs, your program isn't very valuable at all. Finally, fifth element of any computer program, you have to have an endpoint. What's the last instruction? Why? You have to let the operating system know, hey, I'm done using this program. If there's anything you, Mr. Operating System, have been doing to help my program run, you can stop now. It isn't needed anymore. So again, those are the five basic elements of any computer program. This is important when you think about the different types of programs. One type of program is called a script. A script is simply a series of consecutive steps that are executed one after the other. It's related to the idea of a movie script. It's where the name actually came from. With a movie script, the actors say their lines one after the other from the top of the script down to the bottom. There's no variation. There's no like alternates. It's just you go from the top to the bottom. You jump, don't jump around. And that's how a script is used in a computer program, you know, in a computer. What are the kind of things we use this type of program for? Most of the time, they're designed to automate manual tasks. So if you have, you know, every night you pull in, you know, sales reports from 30 different stores from your small regional, um, you know, uh, retail uh, company. And every night you need to take all those 26 reports or whatever and consolidate them into one giant master report. Well, you could have someone stay up all night doing it manually. Or you could write a script that one after the other goes through these files, one through 26, and dumps them all properly formatted into one report. That would be an example of a script. And there are languages designed exactly for that purpose. They're called scripting languages. Remember how I said, why are there so many different types of programming languages? It's their purpose. What are they best for, right? So some of the scripting languages you probably heard of are JavaScript and Python. They're quite common. There's others like PowerShell and a few other, like this is a common thing computer programmers need to do is write scripts. Another type of computer program is an object oriented program. Now we could spend an entire workshop or three or 12 dedicated to this topic. So I'm going to give a brief explanation. We've already covered a central concept here. Object oriented programming is programming that utilizes classes. We talked earlier about the idea of a, um, you know, a room class and we would create an instance of that class. Object oriented programming lets you design the idea of the most conceptual aspect of something like a person or a worker. Let's say a worker. A worker is a pretty abstract kind of thing. If I say, hey, I met a worker the other day, that doesn't tell you anything. Now, if you say, I met a flight attendant on the flight from Dulles International to San Francisco who did an excellent job halfway through the flight at dealing with some turbulence and calming down you know, an upset customer. I'm dealing with a very specific type of worker. Object-oriented programming relates to this because you're writing computer programs that emulate the way the real world works. In the real world, you're going to have lots of different types of workers. You'll have lots of different types of files. And you as a programmer need to be able to think with the abstract concept of a thing and then specific examples of it. And that's what object-oriented programming is all about. And that's as far as we can go down that rabbit hole because there's so much we can study in here. Um, this is one of the, like when we started the school, this is where we started right here with C Sharp and object-oriented programming because it's so fascinating, so powerful, and makes you really valuable in the market. All right, so here's three different categories of languages. The object-oriented programming one I just talked about, which is very often used to make very large line-of-business applications. Line-of-business applications means computer programs capable of helping computer pro sorry helping organizations with all of the different types of operations they do. Look, from accounting to sales to human resources, scheduling, all sorts of things, that's a line-of-business application. Object-oriented programming is very often used to make those. And then there's scripting. We talked about that, automating manual processes. We talked about markup, you know, defining the appearance of data rather than the data itself. The point is that it's advisable to learn at least one of each type of these languages.
so that no matter what kind of ta kind of task you get assigned to, you can handle it. Okay. So the more languages you learn, the easier it is to learn new ones. Our boot camps, by the way, cover at least one of each of the most popular of these types of languages. Some of our boot camps actually include like seven or more languages. There's a lot there. All right. Last thing we're gonna, we're gonna cover is the different types of computer programs. We've already covered scripting. Now let's cover console-based applications. A console-based application is a kind of application where you write the code, you write your computer program, but what's different is where does the user interact with it? And they interact with it in what's called a console. You can see this console window at the bottom, which is you know black background, white text. This console doesn't have any graphical elements to it. There's no little windows and you know graphics to it. It's just a text-based input output area. That's what a console is. And this is still in common use in computer programming. Maybe not for the end user, but internal tools, you see this a lot. This is a console-based application and they're created using general purpose programming, programming languages like your Python, your C Sharp, like you can write them with almost anything. Then there's what's called a window-based or more casually, but more commonly, it's called a desktop application. You write it with a general purpose programming language, but the interface is totally different. It's not inside a console. It's inside an actual window with a lot of graphical elements, like the little buttons at the top right or the top left that let you expand or contract the window. You can resize it. You can show images, all this kind of stuff. That's a console-based application. And again, sorry, that's a, a desktop-based application. An example might be Microsoft Word. You can see it down there at the bottom. Then there's browser-based applications. Now, again, we are talking about a computer program. And I want to stress, the program is running in your browser. It might have other computers it works with, but you have the user interface right inside your browser. An example would be Gmail. When you log into gmail.com, you are using a browser-based email application. Another example would be Zoom if you don't use the desktop version. By the way, a lot of you have seen this because we've been using Zoom and Microsoft Teams and you know Google Meet so much since January of 2020. And you encounter this all the time. Are you going to use the browser-based version of the program or your desktop version? That's all this is. You're still writing the computer program. What changes is the user interface. And finally, just cover a couple of things to, to add some nuance to your understanding and then we will be switching to the Q&A. So UI means user interface. The user is the person interacting with the computer program. The interface is what device or representation of data do they interact with. So UI is how the users interact with the computer. IO, this is hardware. These are all the physical devices that you can get computers, get data into computers or out of computers. Remember I said, purpose of a computer is to take in data, process it in some way, and send it out. They're two separate things. And so input output devices Sometimes they can actually act as both, but it's two separate functions. For example, a touch screen. That's an output device, but it's also an input device. And you have to think with them as an engineer, you got to know those two separate things. And it all comes back to the fundamental purpose of a computer, which is to take in data, process it, and then send it on. Input, work, output. All right. One last thing I want to cover is a type of computer called a mainframe. Yes, they're still in use. They are gigantic computers. They were popularized in the 50s and 60s by big companies like IBM. And you may, may think they're a thing of the past, but they aren't. They are giant computers with massive amounts of processing power. But what's interesting is they don't have a user interface. This is a big giant box with a bunch of computing power inside it. What you do when you want to operate them is you have to have a terminal. This is an actual example of a terminal, an IBM computer, uh, mainframe. They, she's using a little keyboard to actually send data in and a little monitor to have data come out. But I just want to point out, 
the mainframe itself is not built with one of those. It can just do its work without that. But you, if you want to control it, you have to have an interface for it, which is a terminal. So, this leads to one final type of application, which is a terminal application. This is the kind of application that will just let you go back and forth between you and the computer with text-based data. Similar to a console, but it's for these mainframes. And these are still in use. All of these type of computer programs, whether they're terminal programs or they are console-based, desktop, browser, all of them work the same in that they have to be composed of those five basic elements. Entrance point, variables, control and branching instructions, subprograms, and endpoint. They all have that. And the types of languages you'll use to build them depend on the purpose. Scripting for automating uh, uh, you know, routine tasks or object-oriented programming or general purpose languages for building you know, huge applications capable of doing a lot of business work. Um, these are the types of languages you're going to use or markup languages for changing the appearance of data. All right, now we just covered a lot. And we went way over, and you guys are super awesome for sticking around. I see there are a lot are, and I super appreciate it. Um, don't leave yet. We still do have a Q&A session, which I'll be glad to do. And we've got a free gift for you for sticking around. So I'm going to stop sharing, and we'll pick that up. Uh, so Matthew had a question. Yeah. Uh, that earlier, so let me... Are fractions floats? I love that question. <laughs> You have to turn a fraction into a float. Because here's the thing is, the computer is really only going to store a single digit in a single place. So if you have 3.14, you've got three places. You have the ones place at the three. You have the tenths you know, place with the one. And you have the uh, hundredths place. You know, the, you know, the point one point, yeah, it's hundredths. Um, you've only got three decimal places there right? No, I have two decimal places. You've got pl three places you represent data with a 3.14. And a computer is only going to store one piece of information in three of those little buckets. So if you were to take, for example, uh, eight and a quarter, which is a nice little fraction, you'd have to turn it into 8.25. But that brings up a really cool question. What if you had eight and a third? What do you do? What does your float become? This is a choice you have as a developer. And it's all a matter of how much accuracy do you need to be workable? Because eight and a third is 8.333333 repeating. But you're not going to store an infinitely long number in a computer. How far do you want to go in terms of accuracy? To the point of diminishing returns where you aren't gaining anything by adding in more data. And these are trade-offs you need to think of as an engineer. It's a really, really great, great question, actually. And when you're building your computer programs, you might experiment a little bit with, okay, let me do some of the math involved and see if it matters how much detail. Now, I want to touch on math real quick because you brought it up. There is a common misconception that you have to do a lot of math as a computer programmer. Nothing could be farther from the truth. We could talk for a while about why it became ingrained in society that you need to do no math really well to be a programmer. It's absolutely not true. A thousand percent. As long as you can read, write, and do basic math, you can learn to code. We've seen that for decades. But it was a really good question. All right, anything else? Other questions? I didn't say anything else, but if anybody has any questions, please leave it in the chat and we can answer them. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to pop up the closing remarks section of this. Actually, it looks like we have another question. Oh, good. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm transitioning to the tech field. Uh, is a certification enough or do I need to get a degree? What is the best field in uh, IC? 
That's brilliant. Okay, so first let's talk about the certification thing. This question comes up a lot. Um, I'm going to give you the short answer and then I'll be kind of I'll elaborate on it because my short answer is I'm going to sound like a jerk and I don't mean to be. Um, no one gives a crap about certifications in technology. We just don't care. Um, now, there's a slight nuance to that and that is cloud certifications. If you're already an engineer and you get a certification in the cloud, i.e. cloud engineering or cloud security or whatever it is, that can hold a lot of weight. But in terms of getting into the industry, you don't need it. We don't care about certs at all. It's one of the things I love about the industry. We are very much in opposition to you have to accept things because authority said they're that way. We care about what works. We're very pragmatic in that manner. And from the very beginning, we've been rebels. It's the truth. We think differently in computer programming. And we don't have a lot of respect for authorities saying that this is the decreed way to do something or this is okay because Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so said. And that just is translated all the way through the decades to we just don't care about certs at all. Now, if you're going into specifically cyber security, it might help you to get that cybersecurity cert, but I've seen so many people get hired without it. Now, the second part of that question um, had to do with the degree. Look, you gotta make your own personal choice on this one, but I'm gonna be completely blunt. I'm clearly biased. I co-founded one of the best software developer boot camps in the world. The Tech Academy is amazing, and you can break into tech in a matter of a few months, and our graduates make about $60,000 a year. I'd rather continue to go to school evenings night school, whatever, while I'm making 60, 70, $80,000 a year. That's just me. Now, all that obnoxiousness aside, you do learn a lot more in four years, clearly, of going to get a degree. You're going deep into, in depth on some really cool computer science stuff that I actually find personally fascinating and that can be really helpful as you become a senior engineer. But what you're going to miss out on utterly, completely, by getting a degree is any practical tools. You're not going to learn how to do web development, how to use version control, what the modern languages are, what the modern tools are, how software gets made. I've worked with graduates of some of the top engineering schools in the world, and they lament this fact. They don't get taught how the job is done. And so it's a trade-off. You're going you're gonna to miss, you go the boot camp route, you're going to get into the industry real fast, and you're going to learn the like, valuable tools that you need on the job but if you're really deeply interested in that nerdy computer science stuff, data structures, algorithms, all that stuff, you're going to have to continue to learn that on your own or take night classes. And I understand why. But to be very pragmatic about, it, pragmatic about it, if you're just looking to break into the industry, yeah, go to a boot camp. You'll be done in a few months and you get a job for a lot and then you can keep on learning that other stuff later. I hope that answers the question. Anything else come up? Yes. Yes, we have another question. Is Python truly the easiest programming language to learn? Any other easy to learn programming languages in mind for beginners? You know, I like, it's a totally fair question. And I will tell you this. I really do like Python as a way to start. I love JavaScript as a way to start. But I also like C Sharp. Here's the thing. Your choice of language doesn't actually it's not that important. And I'm not trying to invalidate the question at all. It is a great question, but here's what I mean. I went through those five fundamental elements of any computer program. Entrance point, variables, control and branching instructions, subprograms, and exit point. The fact is, if you were to approach any of the popular languages of the day and first just learn how do I do those five things with this language, all of them are easy at that point. Yeah, some of them have a lot more advanced, cool, awesome features. But when you're just beginning and you're just trying to learn how to make a working program that makes use of those five things, any of them will suffice. But I would still say start with Python or JavaScript. If you're self-studying, if you go to one of our boot camps, we'll handle all the sub, you know, everything ahead of time. You can just go right in and take a C-sharp boot camp and you're going to do just fine. Good question. Any other ones come up? Um, no. 
I think that Michael's question is answered. Okay. Well, you've all been really oh. awesome. I want to have a couple of uh, closing uh, remarks here. And then um, we actually completely have a uh, really cool gift for you. Okay. Um, so a word about the Tech Academy. You've heard me like go on about it all night because I, I'm kind of proud of it. And we have a great team and it's awesome. Okay. Um, we have more programs, more certification programs, you know, coding boot camps than any other coding boot camp company on earth. I think we're at 12 different boot camps right now. Okay. Um, here's some, the key things to know about it. Our training schedules are self-paced. You don't have to start and go through at the exact same pace as everybody else. It's a self-paced learning program. And yet we have phenomenal instructor support, even though you're learning at your own pace. They're flexible. You set your own schedule. You don't have a dictated schedule and you can enroll any day of the year. 365 days a year, you can get, you can get started, okay? Um, and that flexibility is really, really awesome. Um, they are very well-rounded. Like from the beginning, we set out to make well-rounded entry-level developers who were set up for a very good long-term career. It was so important to us not to just teach technologies with some quick flash in the pan and only popular right then. I've had success in my career over the years because the fundamentals were laid down so well for me in the Navy. And we wanted that for our, for our graduates. Um, there are pro there are, boot camps are affordable. They're priced under the national average. It's actually a phenomenal value for what you get. And we have a lot of different financing options. And lastly, we have amazing job placement assistance. Uh, the, the people we have in that area are phenomenal. You're not just like, here's your training. See ya. Hope you get a job, right? We give you so much help in that area. And I've already mentioned this, this as well. They're designed for absolute beginners. You don't have to have, have, to have any prior um, coding knowledge. As long as you can read, write, and do basic arithmetic, you're going to be fine. So our programs are for anyone looking for a better career. The fact is technology is a fantastic industry to work in. Um, you can work remotely, which is fantastic for you know, work-life balance. And uh, look, it isn't all about money, but technology, technology pays really well. Um, Jocelyn, uh, I saw your question. Job placement training applies anywhere. The, the methodology we teach on how to get the job is absolutely universal. And it flat out works. There's no guarantees in life. The fact is, like, while there's a lot of jobs available in technology, you do have to work hard to get the job. But we know exactly what to tell you to do. And if you'll just simply execute on that. It happened with a friend of mine last night. Uh, just helping a friend out on the side and he was stuck in the middle of this thing. I told him it's just simple basics. We know the technology of how to get, you know, how to get hired. And he increased his pay by 52 and a half percent by going through with this job search and, and, and landing a new job. It works. It really works. Um, so that's us in a nutshell, right? Now I mentioned a free gift. Okay. Let's go ahead and look at that. Actually, I would like for anybody who's at all interested in who and what we are to request free information. If you go to this nice little special, um, uh, um, yeah, go ahead and paste that, that link in the chat, Rahina. Um, if you grab that, we'll send you out information about the school. Figure out like, if there's any kind of fit for you. And honestly, there's so much data in there to help you just figure out whether or not you want to break into tech. I recommend it, but you got to make your own decision. Okay. And I do want to get you our book. So can you put the, um, if you have a mailing address in the U S we'll mail you, mail you a free copy of our project management handbook. This thing is phenomenal. Like if you want to know like how to make s software and how to run projects, like we've simplified this area so well. I'm really, really proud of this book. Right. Um, so if you go to books at, no, send an email to books at learncodinganywhere.com with your name and address, we'll send you out a free copy of this. Um, it simplifies everything about project management. And actually that's a great entrance point into technology is being a project manager. It's really, really cool. That brings us to the end of the workshop. And I super appreciate you all for attending. Uh, please learn more about our boot camps. 
They are really, really good. And please join me for the free coding class we've got on Saturday. If you go to uh, uh, meetup.com and Eventbrite, you'll find our, um, our meetings. Like we have a lot of these scheduled. I love giving them. I love helping people learn more about computers and technology and just join us. I appreciate your time very, very much for doing this. And especially staying so late. I had no idea it would go over and you guys have been fantastic. So um, we just put the chat, the, the link to our free events in chat. I'm going to stay on so you have an opportunity to grab that. Thank you all for taking the time.